inga mana, inga reo, rau rangatirama, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Welcome everyone to this important public lecture. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Professor Penny Matthew and I'm the Dean here at Auckland Law School. And I'm delighted to be introducing our guest speaker and facilitating the Q&A at the end. Our speaker tonight is Professor Liz Fisher. Liz is a professor at the University of Oxford, Faculty of Law, and has been a fellow of Corpus Christi College since 2000. She is an eminent scholar. Among her many awards are the first prize in the Peter Burke's Book Prize for Outstanding Scholarship in 2008 for her book, Risk, Regulation and Administrative Constitutionalism. She's also an excellent teacher, and in 2009, she won an Oxford University Teaching Award and was shortlisted in 2011 for a National Teaching Award. She has also served as Vice Dean of the Law Faculty at Oxford between 2013 and 2016, and as Acting Vice Dean last year. Liz will be in New Zealand for several weeks, delivering lectures and other presentations at all six of the law schools here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. She begins here at Waipapa Taumataro, the University of Auckland, then moves to AUT and throughout uh, the country before coming back to us in early October for some final events with staff and students. This visit has been a very long time in coming. Um, we actually nominated Liz to be what was then the Law Foundation's um, Distinguished Visiting Scholar back in 2019. And of course, COVID derailed everything and we've made plans and remade them several times. So it's absolutely fantastic to actually have her here. It's just so exciting to be able to welcome distinguished visitors back to the law school. The title of Liz's lecture tonight is Object Lessons, Environmental Law and the Framing of the Natural World. And we're very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say, Liz, and to engage in a dialogue once the lecture is complete. No mai, hare mai please give our guest a warm welcome. Can everyone hear me? Thank you. Um, thank you to the law faculty for your incredible warm welcome um, from faculty, from students, and from the amazing admin team. I would also like to say thank you to the Boren Foundation, who without their support, this lecture and this visit would not be possible. Where I want to start is I want you to imagine this. A scrubby piece of land. Someone, a developer, applies for to subdivide it, to build 50 houses on it. In the past, it has had also development consent to build a golf course, but that never really happened. It's, it's kind of outside a metropolitan area. The development application goes in. The local authority is not particularly happy about it. There is concern about the impact on neighbouring areas which are protected under a variety of different pieces of law. There is also concern about the impact on some species which might be threatened, frogs. There's concern about water and the impact on water pollution and how this property is quite near the coast, how that will affect oyster farming. So the local authority, and there is also public concern about this project. So the local authority turn it down and the developer, as of their right, appeals that decision. As part of that appeal process, there is one site visit, and then there is a kind of attempt to kind of settle. A year later, there's another site visit. 
This time it goes over different parts of, of the site. And at that site visit, the person hearing the appeal asks stop for the car to be stopped and says, what's that white stuff on the ground? Now, this is a site which has had many different experts all over it, both from the developer, from the local authority, and also from members of the public. And the answer comes back, don't know. And one person who, who's on the visit, who's a local person, says, ah, I think it's from the paper mill. I think it's from the paper mill. And so the person hearing the appeal says, I would like inquiries to be made about what this white stuff is. And this white stuff is pretty much all over the site. It's in heaps. It forms a little low wall. It emerges that the white stuff is paper pulp from the mill, that it is contaminated with hydrocarbons. And after further investigation, it, is in, it becomes clear it is contaminated with PFASs, what is known as forever chemicals. The site is contaminated. Nobody, until the person hearing the appeal, asked what is that stuff, saw it, even though the white stuff was there for all to see. Now, I asked you to imagine this, but this is from an actual case from the New South Wales Land and Environment Court last year. The outcome was that one of the conditions was remediation of the site. And I ask you to imagine it because it is a stark example of the way in which environmental problems don't come with little labels on it saying, hello, I'm an environmental problem. Please deal with me. And in this lecture tonight, I want to consider the implication of that fact, that implications that we don't have these type of labels out there in the world. My analysis proceeds by three steps. First of all, I want to consider environmental problems in more detail. Secondly, I want to consider the role of law and the dimensions of the role of law. And finally, I want to consider the recent process and the recent debate over the reform of the Resource Management Act 1991 in this country. I have, as I always have, three caveats. The first, I do not pretend to be an expert on New Zealand law. One of the great honours of being able to give these lectures is I want to learn. And as will become clear, the purpose of my lecture is to provoke debate and to provoke expertise, among others. Secondly, this lecture is part of six lectures, which are all on different topics, but are all about legal imagination. Now, legal imagination is not a contradiction in terms. I will explain what it is um, in a moment. But these lectures crisscross each other. They all are on different topics, they raise different issues, but they all come back to that idea about how we, as lawyers, imagine law and the world that it relates to. And finally, as is probably already obvious, there are no PowerPoints. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I'm afraid to say, and this is a spoiler alert, um, I have no neat answers. Again, the aim of this is to provoke, not to provoke in an aggressive way, but to provoke in a way of to encourage people to foster their expertise in these areas. Okay, so let me begin. Environmental problems. A simple definition of an environmental problem is that there are a situation when those within a community are concerned about the quality of the environment. That very simple definition conceals much. So, if we think about the idea of quality, quality is not a single thing. If I go back to the example that I just gave, 
water quality, the endangered species on a site, and of course we have land contamination. And we could talk about air, and we could talk about other things. So quality is not a single thing that we can kind of put in a box. The other thing about quality and environmental problems is we are often dealing with different scales. Um, when I tell people I am an environmental law professor, the immediate thing they want to talk about is climate change, not contaminated land. Contaminated land is a local issue. Climate change we think of as a global issue, although I'll be talking about that in another lecture. Environmental problems, these issues of quality, also happen over time. Often in relation to environmental problems, we are dealing with things in the present, but we are also seeing ahead to risks in the future. And again, climate change is a good example of that. So what we see is that to begin with, there are lots of different things at play when we are talking about an environmental problem. Now, this is often described by environmental lawyers as problems being polycentric. You know, that there are lots of different things going on. But that doesn't even quite capture the complexity I've just described. But it's not the only complexity at play. As a judge of the Land and Environment Court once said, one person's development bonanza is another's curse. And if we go to this subdivision, you could see the developer thinking, yeah, I'm gonna, we're going to have this housing development, and yeah, we're going we're gonna to get the, the golf course, and, this is gonna, and it was all going to be called the Vineyard Estate and the Vineyard Golf Course. This is great. While people in the local community were concerned about how that community was going to change, and the local authority was concerned about the impact on other industries in the area. So when we are talking about environmental problems, we are also talking about how people want to live their lives. And environmental problems illustrate a point which is well known in Maori thought, is that how we live is tied to the places we live in and the quality of those places. Now, of course, many different people live many different lives side by side. And so a challenge when we're thinking about environmental problems is whose understanding of what environmental quality should look like should be the one that, in a sense, guides decision making in that area. Now, again, what I've just described is often described as environmental problems are about values. But that descriptor, values, also hides again a lot of complexity. Finally, when we're talking about environmental problems, we need knowledge. Now, knowledge may come in many different forms. It may come in the form of what we know as the sciences. But it may come, and again, if I go back to my example, in terms of local knowledge. Someone knowing, oh yeah, that paper, that paper pulp, yeah, that came from the mill. So there is all different types of knowledge in play. We need knowledges, we need expertises in environment when, to understand environmental problems. But as, as also well known to anyone working in this space, environmental problems, are, we, we have a limited knowledge. Now those limits can be in a variety of ways. It may be that we don't know what use a piece of land was put to. It may be that we don't know how to go about, if we go to the frogs on this site, how to figure out how many frogs are on a site. It's not straightforward. You cannot whistle and they all line up and say, hello, we're here for roll call. Um, but it may be deeper issues to do with how do we monitor things. Now, again, environmental lawyers will often describe everything I've just described as scientific uncertainty. And that can often give the impression this is just a data gap. And with a bit more research funding, we can close. But one can see 
that again, it's a whole lot of about how knowledge works within a society. How does it circulate? How is it used? Who is using it? Now, these descriptors, and I'm going to now use the shorthand I just told you are very dangerous shorthands, polycentricity, values and scientific uncertainty also interrelate with each other. And let me just give you two examples of that before I move on. The anthropologist Mary Douglas, in her groundbreaking work on pollution, pointed out that we define pollution as an abnormal intrusion. It is something out of place. It is unnatural. Now, to figure out what is unnatural, we have to have an understanding of what is natural, and that is a social understanding, that is a cultural understanding of what is not natural. So when we are thinking about a problem, an environmental problem, we need to think about what we think is normal. And of course, within different cultures, that might be different. The second thing is we need to recognise that there are some environmental problems that are very, very hard to see. We might find it slightly shocking that nobody thought what is the white pulp on, in some bushland. But consider climate change. As George Marshall has highlighted, it is so big, it is so immense an issue, it's very hard to think about who is responsible and who is impacted. So take Tim Winton, the Australian author, who is someone who has, in his writings, been very committed to environmental issues. In 2017, he wrote this in the Sydney Morning Herald. Then last summer, images started coming back from the Great Barrier Reef, showing massive coral bleaching. And although I accepted the images and testimony of the scientists involved, I really struggled to accept the reality of what they were reporting. A quarter of the reef was critically ill and dying. So recognising that, how do we, we take in and think about environmental problems, particularly on a large scale? OK, so that is my first point. Let me now move to the role of law. Now, you may be thinking, what she's just said, that's the fluffy stuff. It's kind of interesting, um, but, but yeah, it, it, yeah, it's fluffy. Well, it's not fluffy. Um, and that's for three reasons. The first is what I've highlighted is really environmental problems are collective action problems. And in most societies, we may have disagreements over what we want environmental quality to look like, but there tends to be agreement that actually we should look after our environment. And that has meant law becomes engaged. And law becomes engaged because it is the device, it is the practices it, that we use to authoritatively and legitimately regulate, using that word in a loose term, issues in quality of life issues. So law does become engaged. The second point, though, is that unlike when I was at law school doing land law, and I know that we have some land lawyers in the um, room today, with my little flow diagrams with black acre and white acre and green acre, um, where we know what the interests are, the property rights or the interests in the contract, and we know who the parties are, and we know the facts we need to find. With environmental problems, all of those can actually be up for questioning. Who are the parties in the case that I've just described about the subdivision? Is it just the council and um, the developer? Should the oyster farmers actually, should we see them as relevant? Should we be what, that worried about the contamination? What about the frogs? They are all questions that have to be decided. And that brings me to the third role of law. That law is framing the natural world and what it is 
that we think to look at in that natural world and what are the purposes and how we make sense of that natural world. The reason why the acting commissioner in the case I described raised land contamination was not just because he thought it was kind of interesting, but because in New South Wales there is a Land Contamination Act and it is something that legally has to be taken into account. It's not something that the council had thought about, it wasn't something that the developer had thought about, but it is something which in law requires us when you look at a site, contamination is something that needs to be thought about. Now, as is probably becoming clear, there are many different ways that law can frame. It can frame polycentricity, values, etc., in many different ways. And I want to move to that in a moment. But before I do, I want to make two different important points. The first is, by raising framing, you might be thinking that I'm coming over all kind of postmodern. And I'm saying we can frame the natural environment in whatever way we like. I'm not saying that. The natural environment is a reality. There is carrying capacity. And so, in a sense, any choice about framing has to start from that. There is not a freedom to do whatever one in a society likes. It is not an excuse for wishful thinking. The second is that there are questions about how do we frame better or worse, to use not very pretty grammar. How do we how do, we do this in a way which, in a sense, is better or worse? And that is, in a sense, a question that I'm not going to answer fully tonight, but will linger over the last part, the next bit and the last part of the presentation. So how does law frame? Well, the most obvious example is through legislation. A piece of legislation is passed. It sets out purposes and it defines regulatory objects. Now, let me give you just two examples of this. I could give you many. You would be bored. Actually, you'll be bored with two examples, but let me go. So let's take chemicals, chemicals regulation. In most systems we have, regime, cultures, we have legislation that regulates chemicals and their safety. Now, let me provide two different ways of thinking about a chemical as an object. In the US in 1976, the Toxic Substances Control Act was passed. It allows under Section 6 the regulation of chemicals if a chemical presents or will present an unreasonable risk of injury to health and the environment. Chemicals can thus be regulated if they are a risky object. And the role of the regulator is to figure out, you know, is it a risky object or not? Now, you'll be happy to know until the 2016 reforms, only five chemicals were ever regulated under that. Compare that to the European Chemicals Regulation, which is known as REACH, which was passed in 2008. Under Article 5, it has one simple principle. No data, no market. To sell or place a chemical onto the European market, you need to provide safety data. Doesn't matter whether it's risky or not. You just need to provide safety data. Here, we see a law defining a chemical as a market object, not as a risky object. And that creates a whole different way of thinking about the law. My second example is slightly more subtle, and that is the definition of contaminated land. So, Going back to my example, in New South Wales, Section 5 says contamination is the presence of a substance above the concentration at which the substance is normally present in the, the kind of area. 
and it presents a risk of harm to human health or any other aspect of the environment. So here we have a definition that's doing two things. First of all, can you see that definition of contamination as something out of place? And then if it's out of place, the next step is, well, does it present a risk of harm? Compare that to the UK legislation, what is known as Part 2A of the Environment Act 1990. Section 78A says, well, contaminated land by reason of substances, significant harm is being caused or there is a significant possibility of harm being caused. Now, can you see here, the substance doesn't need to be non-natural, but it does actually have to do more than a risk. It has to cause significant harm. The threshold is higher. Now, I could keep on going with lots of examples, but a couple of points to note. First of all, there is no way that language, legislative language or any other language, can capture everything in the natural environment. And Luke Stegmans, in a very good book called Amnesia Road, also points out how historically language and place were closely connected, but in a globalised world, that connection has been, in a sense, disconnected. Language, in a sense, has less meaning because it's not connected to place. And one might think, in terms of the Maori language, that is particularly important because here we have a language far more connected to place. Secondly, legislation must privilege one way of viewing the world. We often think in environmental decision-making we can get consens consensus. But in a sense, you have one definition of contaminated land or you have another. And those different definitions will create different winners or losers. So one can see how the New South Wales definition of contaminated land is going to, in a sense, connect, more sites are going to be deemed contaminated under it than in the UK. That might be the benefit for residents, but not developers, and the other way around. The other thing is framing is not just happening through how we define the natural world. It's happening through the purposes section. It's happening through processes. And most importantly, it is happening through what is delegated to public administration. And that's my next stage of thinking about the role of law. A key feature of most environmental legislation is that it delegates power to public administration and to the executive. And that is because the detail, the expertise, the consultation needed cannot happen within the legislative space. So we see in legislation that the Secretary of State can pass regulations or decide consents. Delegation is often to local government, as it was in the case that I just described. And sometimes the legislation hides what actually is going on. So in the UK, when there is an appeal to the Secretary of State, more often than not, it's to the planning inspectorate. But you wouldn't know that if you read the legislation. And what we see when we get to public administration is not just the classic distinction that we as lawyers know between do we give them discretion or do we constrain them with rules? We see much else. We see, for example, powers, and I'll talk about this more when I get to the RMA, powers to pass policies. And those powers can be given in different ways. Um, they may be constrained in those powers, or they may not be. Um, from the Environment Act 2021 in the UK, um, the Secretary of State can pass targets, um, and the only constraint is that they are able to be met. Um, think about that. <laughs> um, legislation and administrative processes will set out 
Who is involved? What evidence is required? Whose language? What are the different sites for consultation? And of course, there is the big question about the capacity of administrative institutions. What is their funding? What is their expertise? What is their staff? What are the resources they can second? Who else can they talk to? Now, everything I've just described for lawyers is actually quite alien. This is institutional law. This is the law of public administration. And yet we often think that public administration is a kind of empty legal space. But what is happening in that empty legal space, which is not empty, is more framing is going on. So for example, if decision makers have no capacity, if they have no resources, if they don't have the expertise, that will frame the problem again. If actually the local authority has no one who has any expertise in contaminated land, nobody's going to go over the site and think, oh yeah, that's an issue. Or there might be official guidance which reframes the problem. So returning to the UK definition of contaminated land, that legislation allows for statutory guidance. And 2012 it was reformed which makes, in a sense, the definition of significant harm such a high threshold that it is very hard to show that any land is contaminated. Or framing might happen through the models, the scientific models used by administrative decision makers. This has been an issue in the UK in relation to air quality and to pesticide exposure. Those models and just to give you one example, the Downs um, case from 2008 and 9, is a model under EU law had to look at bystander exposure. Now, bystander expo exposure is the kind of person who's just walking by when they're spraying pesticides. Um, and the way in which the model thought about that was to say, well, you might be walking your dog and you just happen to be there when they're spraying. But the argument of Downs in that case was to say, well, actually, bystander exposure has to think about all those residents whose gardens back onto agricultural fields and are getting just a little bit of exposure constantly. That's another way to frame it. Or you may have forms of executive orders. When Trump was president, he um, attempted to pass some executive orders to reframe, to redefine what science is in the EPA. Um, you'll be happy to know Biden, most of that has now gone. Okay, so that is a whole range of framing, quite powerful frames, which might relate to the legislation, might be different from it. But it's not the end of the story, because the next part are, of course, the role of courts. And courts are doing many different things, and there may be many different types of courts. The most obvious is expository justice. Courts are interpreting legislation. They are saying, this is what legislation, this is what this frame is. So again, if I take REACH, the chemical law in the EU, there was a case where you know, someone said, we don't need to provide this safety data because our chemical is safe. And the court's reply was, yeah, no, that's not. <laughs> you know, you put it on the market, you have to provide the safety data. I could go on with many examples. Courts are also engaged in dispute resolution. And again, if we think of this example of the, the subdivision, that is an example of, of dispute resolution. There was an attempt to kind of mediate it. And that resolution is not just about different interests, but also competing understandings about whether there is an environmental problem. And of course, there is an important role that the courts are playing with accountability and ensuring that any legislative scheme and the administrative institutions that are created in relation to that scheme are actually doing what they are meant to do. And King Salmon in this country 
might be an example of that. Okay, environmental problems might be structurally different from the type of problems that you're used to in other areas. But you've probably just noticed I've walked you along the song line of the separation of powers. And one of the things that I've always found fascinating about environmental law is we often think it's the kind of hippie wild child subject. And yet it uses all the legal resources of a polity to operate. It uses legislation and delegated legislation and administrative law and soft law and, and courts in a variety of ways. The second point is that there are, and I have brought one today, no magic wands in all of this. By using all those institutions, it doesn't work by the way. Um, by using all those institutions, this is messy stuff. This is often seemingly incoherent and it is ongoing. Under any legislative regime, what we see is change over time. And finally, what is being engaged here is legal imagination. Now, what I mean by that is we are having to think about the mental constructs that we use to think about and reason with law and to think about how those mental constructs about what legislation is, what a court does, what we think administrative law is, how does that change in light and evolve in relation to environmental problems? And that legal imagination, that, that how is it, you know, should we constrain legal thought in this area? How do we empower it? What, are, what is legitimate legal reasoning in these cases and not is really the stuff in these areas. But it comes from this way in which law is framing the natural environment. And that brings me in my last kind of 10 minutes to the final stage of my talk. And that is to reflect a little bit on the Resource Management Act 1991 and the proposals for reform that are on the table. Now, you'll be happy to know I'm not going to walk you through those reforms. You'll also be happy to know this is not my submission to whatever thing needs to be submitted to. But I do want to make um, a couple of comments about that act and relate it to what I've just said. So the Resource Management Act, which was passed in, in 1991, and I think if I remember rightly, replaced about 47 different pieces of legislation was and is an ambitious piece of legislation which puts sustainable management at the heart of environment and planning in New Zealand. As I wrote about about eight years ago, I think of it as a small c constitution. It is a piece of legislation which is framing the natural world. It is empowering a range of administrative institutions and it does have a significant role for the courts. But it is, like all environmental problems and anything to do with environmental problems, always a contested space. Um, and as many commentators have noted, over its lifetime, it has, with ongoing reform, inched up in its pages. I think it's gone from 300. Uh, there will be those in the audience who know the exact numbers. It's gone from about 350 to, I think, 750 two pages. And in the last two years, there has been an important process which is no longer looking at that incremental reform, but actually saying, can there be more wholesale reform? And there are a number of different interventions in it, but let me highlight three. First of all, the Randerson report in 2020, um, which really kind of kicked off this process and really looked at what would, you know, a new Resource Management Act look like. An exposure bill published by the government in 2021 and an Environment Committee of the um, Parliament um, report on that bill at the end of last year. Now, to begin with, reading all those documents <laughs> Um, and reading the commentary on it, what we can see is all that complexity of environmental problems all over the place. It's thinking about water, it's thinking about housing, 
is thinking about climate change. I could go on. And of course, there are lots of different values on display. Take, for example, um, the parliamentary statements um, on the proposed bill. Very different views, very different visions about what does a good life in New Zealand look like. And if you dig down to, into the submissions, you can see more. And of course, there are issues about knowledge. The new bill rests on the idea that we should focus on both environmental limits and environmental outcomes, two ideas that we need knowledge about for them to work. Now, most of the debate has focused on legislation um, and highlighted the problems of lack of clarity in the idea of sustainable management and the way in which in administrative practice and legal practice, it could dissipate into something that was not necessarily legally meaningful. Um, and so the Randerson um, report recommended that environmental limits be minimum standards to achieve the purpose of the act um, and that they must provide a margin of safety above the conditions in which significant and irreversible damage um, to the natural environment. So quite a strict definition, both which is tying that idea of environmental limits to the purposes of the Act and also tying it to science. But in the Exposure Bill, we simply see that environmental limits are there to protect the ecological integrity and human health. Science and those purposes have kind of slipped out of the way. That is a very different framing of the natural world. Likewise, the Environment Committee, in talking the, the, the bill's provisions on outcomes, it said that the bill is suggesting it should, the exposure kind of draft says it should be promoted, and it says, no, it needs to be provided for. So here we see examples of people knowing full well that legislation frames. But what we see when it comes to public administration is more silence. So the Randerson report in its introduction says, the success of any new regime will depend on the cap capacity and the capability of those institutions making decisions. Likewise, many commentators have drawn attention to the importance of the process by which any national planning framework, which is kind of key under the Act, will be passed. But there isn't much detail. It's pretty silent. And that silence becomes even more significant when it comes to the role of courts. The role of courts in dispute resolution, in accountability, is almost silent. And Palmer and Clark, in a recent paper, have really pointed out how much of a failing this is in this regime. And they've pointed to the UK Environment Act in contrast. Now, that, that act has many weaknesses. I'll be talking about that in other lectures. Um, but one feature it does have is it's created a new office for, the, for environmental protection. My point is that in talking about reform, in talking about how we reframe the natural environment, we can't just talk about the legislation, even if that is what is being passed. We need to think about public administration and we need to think about the role of the courts. Okay, let me sum up. I started with thank yous. They weren't just polite, they were sincere. But they were also highlighting a really important point. Within a society, when we collectively come together to deal with environmental problems, we need communities. We need expert, expert communities, we need law schools, we need professionals. And we need also support for those communities. Support for conversations, and often difficult conversations. I then asked you to imagine a problem. There is a lot of danger in environmental law that we end up with abstractions, particularly in an era where we say everything is global. We don't think very much about subdivisions with frogs and contaminated land. By the way, it was also next door to a crematorium. 
which is kind of interesting kind of thing. And, and you know, and, and it had consent for the, the golf course. But so many of environmental problems, that is the space. They are grounded in real places with real communities. I then moved through environmental problems. And I showed that environmental problems are complex. And that complex has a structural feature that makes them difficult for lawyers to deal with. And yet, as lawyers, we must deal with them. And in particular, we must recognise that law is framing the natural environment, that it does it through legislation, it does it through the administrative processes it constitutes and limits, and it does it through the work of courts. And in thinking about all of this, we need to recognise the importance of legal imagination. Finally, I turn to the Resource Management Act. Um, a comment of Palmer and Clark, which I do love, is that um, at the moment it's all soggy in coherence and complexity. Um, one, the question we've got to ask is, we can all probably agree that soggy in coherence and complexity is not desirable, but we need to ask whether dry coherence is possible. And I've made an argument that in thinking about real reform, we need to move beyond the legislation to the institutions and the courts. Now, there's much I have not covered today. I haven't covered the important Maori dimensions of resource management reform. I haven't delved into other details. But what I have done is asked you to foster your legal imagination. Thank you.